Ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've all been waiting for, we finally get to talk about my 2006 Evo9 Time Attack car. Uh, I've been building this car for quite a few years and right away I need to thank Professional Awesome Race Design. Uh, Mike and Dan work over there. They've helped me throughout the, since the beginning. Um, you'll see a lot of their parts on the car, a lot of their ideas are from them. Uh, don't worry about the execution, but they've been a huge part of this car and a huge part of its success. I actually talked to Mike earlier this week and we went through some data analysis. And he figures that this car is making between 1,500 and 1,700 pounds of downforce at 150 miles an hour. Now that's kind of comparable to a Viper ACR. Dodge claims about 1,533 pounds of downforce at 150 miles an hour, which is pretty decent considering this is a four-door family car. In this video, we're going to start at the front of the car and work our way back. We'll show you all the modifications we've done. And at the end of the video, we'll go through some data analysis between this car and a similar modified Evo 9. And we'll also compare it to a Viper ACR on the same track. Now this car was built for Grid Life Street Mod series and the rule stated that every all of your arrow had to be within five inches of the OEM body lines. So that's how kind of how all this is set up. Um, we'll start off with the splitter. Um, some key areas on the splitter, you want something um, really strong, doesn't have a lot of flex in it. Um, you want a nice rounded edge on the front. Uh, you don't want a really sharp edge. You want the air to be able to flow nicely underneath and on top. Um, setting your angle of attack is probably one of the most important things. Uh, the way I set mine is you want to have your car all set for ride height and then put it up on blocks that are perfectly level. Uh, some cars have a little bit of a rake, so if you kind of go by the frame rails or something like that, you can end up with too much or too less of, a, of an angle on your splitter. Uh, this one is set at about one degrees down. Another key thing is mounting. You want this thing not to be moving at all. Um, one of the products I use from Professional Awesomes is their splitter rods. Um, these things are Absolutely awesome, uh, professionally awesome actually. They're super strong, as you can see. You can easily stand on these. I don't have this all mounted up right now, but it'll hold me up easy. And the, one of the best things I like about them is if you hit something, you go off track or anything like that, they actually bend. So they'll actually flex upwards so you don't end up wrecking your splitter or, or blowing a hole through something like that. Um, a few of the other key things are an end plate. Uh, we were allowed those. Um, that helps keep air up on top of the splitter, creating just a little bit more downforce, and you were allowed diffusers. So I made a custom set of Professional Awesome diffusers I'll show you underneath. Alright, these are my splitter diffusers. Uh, these were made by Professional Awesome. These are actually not out yet. They should be coming out pretty soon. They have this extra channel built in here that helps with a little more downforce. Uh, these are actually pulling air kind of from all around and helping channel it and create more downforce and keep creating a flow towards uh, the inside of the wheel, kind of in between the frame and the wheel. And it helps start getting air towards the back of the car and out. We're trying to get it out kind of out the wheel to help cooling with brakes and then also out the fender to create a little less drag. Another thing about the splitter you want to be sure of is all of this needs to be completely blocked off. Uh, I normally just use tape on mine. A lot of people use garden edging, but from here to here, all of this needs to be completely sealed. You can't let any air, if any air is getting through there, you're actually losing downforce and losing efficiency. The last thing I want to talk about on a splitter is how close it is to relation to the, in relation to the ground. Uh, the closer you can get the splitter to the ground, the better it's going to work down to about 15 millimeters. That's five eighths to three quarters of an inch. Um, It'll work best, the diffusers will be pulling air still. If you get any closer than that or you touch the ground, it actually cuts the airflow off. Now you might think if it touches the ground, there's no air behind it, which means no pressure. Um, that sounds right, but it's wrong. You need airflow underneath this thing in order for it to work right. The airflow needs to be going under and speeding up, and that creates your downforce. Moving into the fender area, we have these right here on the back of the bumper. These are tire spats. Um, these are kind of go, these are supposed to go kind of just to the edge of the, the front tire. Um, these are a little wider than I normally run. I normally run a 255 and this is a 295, but just to the edge of the tire and they kind of help direct air out and around that tire. Um, it'll also help pull air from the inside. It has a side effect, it'll kind of help with cooling and helping get air out of the, out of the fender area. Um, the end plates also are in this area. Uh, they help create a vortice depending on how, what kind of uh, shape you have here, but they help direct air kind of down the side of the car. They can create a, a vortice though, 
they'll kind of help keep air from going underneath the car as you're driving. So you want to keep that low pressure that the splitter is creating under the car. And this, will, this vortice will help keep that under the car and will kind of block high pressure air from going in there. Continuing back from the fender, uh, we have a spacer here. I spaced the fender from the bottom. I also cut, there used to be a lip right along here that kind of stuck out and blocked air. As you can see, there's still some of it left up on top here. There's also a little bracket here, but I shaved all that off and that kind of lets air come through the fender and kind of vent through here and get down the side of the car. Uh, up on top is more professional awesome stuff. This is one of their air extractors. Uh, this gets air out of the car kind of by air moving over top of it and it kind of creates like a bubble that goes up and out. Um, it kind of pulls air from inside the fender area underneath here and gets it moving out. There's a lot of high, pr high pressure that's created from the tire uh, moving so fast and going fast down the road. So you want to get all that high pressure out and it helps reduce drag. Here's an example from Midwest Festival of 2020. Uh, if you look right here, pay attention to this area, I'll click forward in the pictures. You can see the vortices coming off the, the bottom of the end plate right here. Now I'm speeding up coming down this, so they're kind of getting stronger and stronger. You can really see them in the last few pictures here. Just the little circles of air coming off there, and these are strong, you de they don't want to move. So that high pressure air that's kind of on the side is protecting the underside of the car just a little bit. You can also see on the other side these vents are working really well. Um, just dissipating some pressure that's on the inside the fender uh, coming out real nicely. Another thing to mention is the all of the spray up in the air. So all of this is getting picked up off of the track and then getting shot up in the air. Um, this is most of my kind of shows all the downforce that the car is making. Next up we have just a small modification. These are APR mirrors. Um, they're about the half the size of stock mirrors and they save just a little bit of little bit of drag and they actually weigh about two pounds less than the than the stock ones as well. Moving back up front, uh, this is the intercooler and radiator area. Um, we actually have this ducted off. So this is ducted underneath on both sides and then right across the top here. Um, so all the air that's going through here needs to pass through the either the intercooler or the radiator to help cool. And then we have it moving up and out the hood right here through this hood vent. Uh, I made this little kind of a block off plate here. Normally the grill is open, but we don't want that going through and then kind of shooting and cutting off our air. So I blocked this off so all the air has to come through the bottom here and then out the hood. Here is the radiator setup. This radiator is normally in, in stock location. It's right back here. As you can see, this frame usually keeps on going straight. Um, I actually notched this and moved the whole radiator forward just about two inches and it helps line it up a little bit better with the hood vents. The biggest area that it helped in was uh, working on the turbo. So we actually have an extra two inches here. So you don't have to dismantle the whole turbo and everything to take it out. Um, you can actually take all these bolts off, disconnect your lines down there, and the whole turbo and assembly will come out as one. Now you can see through these vents, it's kind of lined up just about right. The radiator is just ahead of where the vent starts. And after it goes through the radiator, it can kind of go right up out through these vents. Um, you want to make sure that these aren't too high right here. Uh, if you get too much of an angle, they can actually shoot air too high and it can disrupt your wing all the way in the back. So we have these bent over just a little bit. Uh, this hood is actually made by DMN Racing, a buddy of mine named Mike Boglisi. Um, one thing I did during track days is these types of vents, if air is coming up from the top here and going over, if you don't have these sides blocked off, the air can actually be running right back in there and you won't be getting very much ventilation. So I actually run just a piece of tape across the side of this to help with air kind of sneaking in the side there. Moving down the side of the car, these are side skirt extensions. Uh, these are actually from Menards. These are gutter aprons you can buy for three or four dollars. It's a perfect paint match for a great Evo 9, by the way. But I just attached them to the bottom of the side skirts. Uh, all that low pressure that's coming from the splitter and going underneath the car, you want to keep that low pressure underneath the car the whole way. And anytime you can extend the bottom of the side skirt down as low as you can to the ground, that's going to help keep that air underneath there and stop kind of that higher pressure air from coming in from the side. All right, now most cars don't have these. These are Vortex generators. They create just a little vortice off the back of these to help keep the air stuck to the back window. If you look at the the angle of the roof compared to the back window, 
you'll see that it's kind of abrupt, so air has a hard time staying attached up here. And anytime you have detachment, you'll get kind of like a bubble back here, and that will create drag. So these help keep the air stuck to the back windshield, which also helps keep a little straighter flow to your rear wing. This is the wing that I run. It's a Cognition 68 inch by 10 inch cord, just a trunk mounted wing. It's borderline not enough for all the arrow that we have going on in the front of this car. Last but not least, we cut the rear bumper up just a little bit higher so air coming underneath the car doesn't catch it and create more drag. Let's get into some data analysis here. If you guys ever see me at the track and I'm in my trailer, this is most likely what I'm doing. I love looking at this stuff and comparing lap times and data. Uh, this is me, my Evo 9 versus my brother's Evo 9. Very similar cars. I'm at about 450 horsepower. Casey's at about 420. My car is a little lighter, about 200 pounds. And then all he has for aero is just a rear wing. Uh, both have suspension. Both on AO52s. I'm on 295. He is on 255, so a little disadvantage for him but this is Brainerd International Raceway uh, we're gonna go through corner two which is right here this long flat corner on this graph we have speed and mile per hour and on the bottom we have distance so this is each this is our speed at each distance around the track uh, we come out of corner 12 both about the same I have just a little more acceleration in third and then as you can see we shift into fourth gear it's pretty much the same. Uh, we're gaining in speed just a little bit and once we hit fifth gear he has a little slower shift than I do but we're about seven miles an hour apart speed is right over here and we shift into fifth and you can see these two lines getting closer and closer as we get up to speed. Um, seven miles an hour distance here and about three miles an hour at the top that is because of all the drag that my arrow is causing. Uh, you're always going to be a little bit slower that's the price to pay for having downforce but we're going to gain most of that and a bit more when we get into this corner two here. Uh, I enter about 146, Casey's a 143, and I just do a gentle lift off the throttle and kind of slowly get back on and get back moving. This was fairly easy. It, the car wasn't out of shape or anything like that. felt nice and smooth. Casey had to brake quite a bit, slow down. Um, he's a wild man, so he probably came in just a little bit hot. This is 122. And then after Apex, it looks like he had to slow down a little more, down to 118, 19, and then get back on throttle. Uh, most cars are in the 110 to 115 mile per hour range going through two. Uh, we were able to get up to 144 before corner three. He was at 136. If you look at the bottom here, you can see the time distance gap. This is how far I am ahead of him. I'm nine tenths ahead coming into the corner. And when we get into the break zone for corner three, I'm 1.7, so we gained 8 tenths of a second just in that one corner with all the arrow modifications. This is the video of that lap. Uh, coming up to corner one, flat out, shift into fifth, I'll come up about 146 miles an hour, and you'll see kind of how easy the car makes it through the corner. Just booking. Let's get into the Viper ACR comparison. This is me versus Luke McGrew and his Viper ACR. Uh, I'm on 255 AO52s. Uh, the ACR is on 295 front ACR tires and 355 rear ACR tires. Uh, they run about 645 horsepower, so I don't know what they are at the wheels, 550 to 580. I'm at about 530 horsepower. As far as weight, I'm about 3,000 pounds and the Viper ACR is at 3,400 pounds, so a little heavier. Uh, the, we're at Gingerman Raceway. My lap time is a 134, 131.44. His is a 132.589. When Dodge came out and brought their Viper ACR to a bunch of different tracks, they actually came to Gingerman and ran a 131.9. So Luke McGrew just a little bit slower than that. Um, you'll see I, get, I have a little more speed coming on straights. So we start off the lap. I'm about 7 miles per hour faster coming into one. We break about identical. I overslow just a little bit, he gains a little on me, about the same coming up to two. Uh, we flip flop here, I carry a little more speed, he slows down a little bit more. Through two, coming up to four, or coming up to three, I get a little bit more speed through fourth gear, break a little bit later, gain some time, we're about even here, uh, minimum speeds. 
Coming up to my least favorite part of the track, this is the 5-6 combo. A little bit more speed coming in, brake about the same, but Luke is able to trail brake a little better than me. Carry more speed in, but it's kind of a give and take. I come slower in, faster out, and he's a little faster in, slower out. Uh, coming through here, we're about the same, I have a little more speed there. This is where the Viper ACR has a little bit more grip, I think, these long sweepers. Uh, carries a little more speed through there. And this is kind of the one arrow track, or arrow corner at the track. I carry a little bit more speed through here. I'm able to stay on gas through corner 7, 8. This is Luke's first time at the track, so he, I'm sure he gained a little more speed later on in the day. Uh, breaking about the same here. Same minimum speed here. Coming down the back straight. You can see my power coming up and gaining quite a bit here. Uh, break early. He breaks later. Viper has huge breaks. Uh, as you can see, he catches back up to me down to speed and about the same coming through the final corner. That's how my Evo 9 compares to a Viper ACR. It's kind of crazy how similar these cars can look on track with how different they are in setup. Thanks for watching, guys. Let me know what you think of all the modifications we did in the comments. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time when we go through this car's electrical system.